Hi everyone, thanks so kindly for joining us. My name is Kurt Johnson, I'm the event coordinator for Green Apple Books here in uh, San Francisco. And tonight we have the pleasure of hosting uh, students, alumni, and faculty from the Institute of American Indian Arts for a night of indigenous storytelling. Let's give it up for that before we even start. Very happy to have the IAIA crowd here, and thank you all for, for showing up. We appreciate you. You could be anywhere on Monday, and you chose to be with us, and we appreciate that. Uh, tonight, we are going to be hearing a work from Tracy Abeda, Ivy Leidenberg, Alec Tiger, and Deborah Jackson. Talk on. Let's give a hand for all of them. Okay. So, I'm sorry to say that uh, Jennifer Forrester is not going to be joining us this evening, um, but uh, I'm appreciative of Alec for stepping in uh, in her place, and uh, we're wishing Jennifer well, and we will see her soon, I'm very sure. Uh, thank you for joining us both in person here tonight and online. Hello, online audience. We appreciate you. We are broadcasting from San Francisco. We are on unceded Wimotisho Lone land, and we hope that you join us in our pledge to turn land acknowledgement into action by donating either your time or monetary means to an indigenous organization each time you hear a land acknowledgement. Uh, at the back desk here, uh, next to the mess, we have a QR code that will take you directly to the Wimotisho Ohlone Land Trust website where you can find out more on how to participate in this project of re repatriation. Uh, I'm very proud to say that this event is presented in partnership with Whitquake, San Francisco's Literary Festival. And yay, <laughs> that's the correct response. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Sophia Cross from Whitquake to say a few words about the organization. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm Sophia. I'm director of operations at Litquake. Um, Litquake is the West Coast's longest running literary festival, and we will be celebrating our 25th anniversary in October. And this year's festival will be from October 10th to the 25th with events all over San Francisco and the East Bay. We'll be finalizing our programming and announcing that um, late August, early September. So keep an eye out at our website, litquake.org. We also do year-round programming. Most recently, it'll be an event this Saturday, April 13th, at Grace Cathedral to celebrate National Poetry Month, curated and hosted by D.A. Powell and Preeti Vagani. Four celebrated poets will share their work, Brenda Hillman, Kathy Park Hong, Dong Lee, and Brian Tierney. A book sale and signing will follow the readings. This event is free with a five to ten dollar suggested donation. We have an, some more great events coming up later this month and during the summer as well. And again, you can find our full schedule on our website, litquake.org. And that's my little spiel. So thanks again for coming out, and I'll give it back to Car. Uh, Lake Lake is one of my favorite things about living in the Bay Area, so I feel very lucky that also when they heard about this event happening, they were like, absolutely, we want to be a part of it. So, uh, thanks. Thanks for being here. Uh, very brief business before we get to the heart of the evening first. Now's a good time to silence your cell phones if you have not already. Uh, just don't take a call in the middle of the reading. That would not be cool. Um, please do check out our full event calendar on our website, greenapplebooks.com. We have a really great season ahead of us uh, if you enjoy the event that you're currently attending, you might like what else we have coming up in the near future. Uh, the restroom is behind me and is available after the event and not during the event for obvious reasons. If you need to know how to get there, do ask me and I'll gladly help you. Uh, we have Deborah's book available at the front register. And uh, while Jennifer couldn't join us tonight, I would highly encourage you to purchase her book directly from the publisher, Sun Cave's website. If you are able, that would be the best way to get it at this point. Uh, and uh, do either of our other authors have like books on the horizon or anything coming up? Ivy does. Yeah. Uh, March 2025. Oh my goodness. Okay, mark your calendars. <laughs> March 2025. <laughs> it's coming uh, sooner than you suspect. Um, 
So congratulations, that's what I would be. Um, and uh, if you've been here before, you've certainly heard me say that when you buy books from us, not only do you support us as an independent bookstore, you support the authors who put so much work into making these books, and then you get to have a book, uh, which might be the best part. So if you are able, we always appreciate it. Thank you so kindly. Pre-orders pre -orders count for that too, by the way. So um, pre-ordering Ivy's book would be, is always a really big boon for authors. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first reader. First, Tracy Albeda is a third grade dropout who didn't get a GAD, but snagged two master's degrees. And after turning 40, she decided to write for real and has been published in Hobart Pulp, The Brooklyn Review, and Diagram. She is pursuing an MFA in fiction from the Institute for American Indian Arts, and she won the Catherine Bakeless Nason Award in Fiction for the 2023 Breadloaf Writers Conference and was a finalist for the 2023 Suwannee Review Nonfiction Contest. She teaches literature and lives in Oakland with a free roaming lion head rabbit named Betty, who is two pounds but can eat a tunnel through a patch. Please welcome Tracy Albert. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank Deborah for all the opportunities she's given us at IAIA. This is a dream come true because I'm a local and I was a little kid going to Green Apple Books. So I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. And I'm nervous. <laughs> Um, this is a chapter from my book called Calavera, and it's pretty new, so this is the first time I'm reading it. My dad buried Vanilla the guinea pig by the back fence. He made a little cross out of two sticks and a string and stuck it in the fresh dirt. R.I.P. Vanilla, I said. Guinea pigs are native to the Andes Mountains. They were brought down to sea level by the European exotic trade in the 1500s. I, wonder if, I wondered if Vanilla was back up in the Andes with their ancestors. I thought about Vanilla every time I saw the dark green foiled Andes chocolates in the crystal dish at Noni's house. A squirrel ran by, stopping and running, stopping and running in that jerky squirrel way. Squirrels are indigenous to the Americas. One squirrel fossil dates back 36 million years. Squirrels were kept as pets until the 19th century. I thought about how guinea pigs outlasted squirrels in the pet department. But the squirrel was thinking something else. The squirrel was thinking, R.I.P. guinea pigs. Our pet cemetery grew over the years until we weren't sure who was buried where because they all got stick crosses. Of course we would remember where our beloved pet was buried. Then the crosses blew off with winds and rains and earthquakes. The land didn't want us to mark it. These aren't your pets, it said. These are not your pets, it repeated. And anyway, you can't pet them now. They are bones. They are records. They are the truth. They are mine. The land was keeping count. The town south of our town was known as the dumps. The town smelled sickly sweet from the freeway. People lived in that town, even though on the other side of the freeway by the Bay Edge was the dumps. My dad would pack up the truck bed full of junk, then rope it down like it was a treasure, then pay money to jump, dump, uh, dump junk in the dumps. He came back with an empty truck. He swept out the truck bed. He put the broom in the corner of the garage. The junk had been dumped at the dumps. Problem solved. My mom drove us to Berkeley so we could have friends. We drove up 880 until you could see the big buildings of San Francisco on the left. Cities look fake far away as if, we're just a pic as if they were just a picture of a city and the rubber rim around the car window, the frame. When I saw new people, this is what they seemed like too, apparitions. I saw myself outside of myself, how quiet and awkward I had gotten. I was used to receiving information from the TV, from books, from my parents, from my brother. I was like a pet, reacting to power, living for food, and not much else. There will be other homeschoolers there, my mom said, looking out at the water once we hit 80. Well, we aren't even homeschooling, my brother said. My mom didn't want to process the fact that we weren't learning anything and didn't have a plan to learn anything. She seemed to think everything would turn out just fine. She didn't want to process the facts. We passed Emeryville, but we didn't think about how we were passing Emeryville. There was a train and a bunch of white industrial buildings, and that was Emeryville. 
We didn't know we were driving over the largest of 425 shell mound remains surrounding the Bay Area. We didn't know that this Emeryville shell mound was once 60 feet tall, like a five-story building. Adults drove children across Emeryville, back and forth, back and forth, maybe from school, maybe from unschooling them. King Tut stories and Roman Empire stories marinated in everyone's head. History, 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 hissed in their ears. They went up 80, they went down the 80. Ah, if the freeway could talk. But instead, the freeway was doing what the freeway does. It gets people the jobs they hate or hate a little less than the job before. There are no palm trees on the 80, but there is still some sort of mission. The mission is to forget the facts of what is happening. Drive and drive and you will get there where you need to be. We're all going somewhere for some reason, right? When researchers sifted through the Emeryville shell mound, they called it a midden. Midden means domestic waste or animal waste or dunghill. Basically, they were calling it the dumps. Middens were all over the world at coasts and lake shores. Researchers got all excited about the shells and shit and tools and middens. Look at how these people live, they said as they sifted through. They were probably all like, ew, the dumps are sickly sweet smelling. The sweet smell meant low oxygen and low oxygen meant preserving organic matter, like jam in jars. So when they came across human remains, they could hardly believe how preserved the bones were. Layers represented years of life, hundreds and thousands. They knew who was doing what and when, all because of these dumps. The junk was transformed back into something worth looking at because the researchers were looking. We drove up the long tree-lined street of a Berkeley neighborhood. It looked like we were going to someone's fancy house, but then my mother parked the car at the curb and we saw a small park. We showed up to what looked like a party, but there are no balloons or cake or presents. It was a, hey, we can socialize like normal kids for two hours kind of party. Yay, homeschooling, but not really homeschooling friends. Everyone looked like they could use some sun, but a particularly pale kid handed me a big piece of cardboard, pointed behind me, and said, look. There was a gigantic cement slide with steps next to it, sunk into a mountain. If there was one thing my brother and I liked to do, it was to skirt death. We ran up the stairs and looked down from the top of the hill. The dumps next to my town were as high as the Berkeley slide. Seagulls flew around over the junk mountain. One weird thing, the closer you got to it, the less sweet it smelled. The closer you got to it, it didn't smell at all. Get closer. There's a bike, a whole red bicycle. Get closer. Holy crap, who is throwing away perfectly good children? Do you see her in there? Okay, because I was gonna say, there are a lot of lies that keep you from seeing the truth. In 1909, a researcher at UC Berkeley named Nels Nelson told the truth. He took a map and started going off on it, marking all 425 shell mounds he could find around the Bay Area. He considered this an emergency situation. Why? Oh, well, I don't know. Maybe because in 1877, they lopped off the top of the Emeryville shell mound and built, built a dance hall on top of it. Shave and haircut, two bits, bones, danced on top of bones. My mother dressed us up for Easter with creased new dress clothes from Urban's. We attended family gatherings on her side where there were so many cousins, we had a Tetris folding tables and chairs inside Noni's garage. Garlic hung down from the rafters. The sodas were lukewarm in a cabinet, just how Europeans like it. Do you want Noni to get you a soda water? She always asked my brother. They weren't real soda. They were Hansons, all natural, no chemicals. Our cousins had perms and nail polish and stussy t-shirts and brand new airwalks. They weren't kids stored in a cabinet out in the garage. There were cold Pepsis and a fridge in the house, like normal. Your dad said the truth will always come out. Don't lie because it will catch up with you. You believe this even as you see him steal candy out of a plastic bin at Food for Less. You think about what he said when your dog Mackenzie digs up the wooden box you made for Vanilla the guinea pig. The little coffin holds the truth. This little piggy went to heaven. Your vanilla is gone even though you could shake the box and hear little bones rattle. You know that bones stay while the soul goes. That's what you learned over and over and over and over and without school. Everyone knows that, but you don't shake the box. Your own bones know not to. You... Oh, 
coffin. You yell at the dog and bury Vanilla's coffin, this time deeper. With a knick-knack, patty whack, give a dog a bone. You accidentally sing in your head as you do all this. You should make a new cross while you're at it to remember where Vanilla is or isn't. I laid on my bed and I laid in the bathtub and I watched my body grow. Or more like, I grew outside of those containers and when I got back in them, I saw myself inching closer to the bottom. My feet kept getting bigger, my legs longer, my arms, my hands. I stretched and sometimes I could feel the stretching and it got me worried. The reaching and almost touching meant I was almost out of time, that I was growing up and life was passing me by. I was a hidden thing in blankets in a house. I was E.T. hiding within the stuffed animals and doll clothes in the closet. My bones grew and they said, if you don't hurry up and do something, you will never catch up to us. You will be an adult, but mentally you will be a little kid. But I didn't know where to take my bones. My bones grew and I got left behind. The dance pavilion was something of a novelty for park goers. 90 feet in diameter, 40 feet from the floor to the peak of the roof and situated well above ground level, the pavilion provided a picturesque view of Oakland, the bay and surrounding countryside. The fact that native artifacts and burials lay beneath the floor, when considered at all, only seemed to heighten the curiosity and attraction of dancing in the pavilion, the Emeryville Historical Society. I was a nesting doll buried in the very middle. It was me, then my brother, then my father, then my mother, then her mother. There was no getting to me, the oxygen of real life. I was safe from fires. Truth was, I was getting comfortable. In 1901, the dance pavilion on top of the Emeryville shell mound suddenly and mysteriously went up in flames. That's when I started having the thoughts at the top of that cement slide gripping the cardboard what if I stop gripping the cardboard, let go of the cardboard, let the firefighters come? They always come first, you know, because your brother's seizures, you probably won't die. And even if you did, how is this worse than being trapped in your room? Just let go. Just let go. Mom will be pissed. They'll probably arrest her. School hasn't let out. The other moms are probably doing it the legal way. Bad boys, bad boys. What you gonna do? But she'd get out of it. She always gets her way. Then she'd beat your ass when they come for you. And you let go and you close your eyes and you split your head open like a cut melon and you bring your skull over over to your mother and she says not now and you say but but my, but my brains and you hear the fire truck and it goes to the dance pavilion in 1901 and it's 1989 and they still haven't found you thank you can we give one more hand for tracy please We love it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our next reader as well. Ivy Leibenberg is an enrolled citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. He lives in Chico, California, and has worked as a firefighter with Cal Fire for the last 16 seasons. He's a lecturer at Chico State University, a recent graduate of the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts in both poetry and fiction. His work has appeared in Poetry Magazine, Three Penny Review, Ecotone, among others, and he's a finalist of the 2023 James Welch Poetry Prize in Poetry Northwest, winner of the Tribal Colleges Journal 2023 Student Creative Writing Contest in both fiction and poetry, and his poetry manuscript was the winner for the 2024 Solo Emerging Writers Prize. Keep an eye out for Birds of Night. Birds of Night. Birds of Night is forthcoming in 2025. Please give a hand for Ivy Lane. Yay! Thank you, uh, Green Apple Books and Deborah, of course, and of course the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, I'm going to read both uh, poetry and fiction tonight. I'm going to start out with two poems. Um, this first poem is titled Wolf O'er 93. It's about the wolf that came a thousand miles down into California and then uh, made it as far down as it was right around Fresno and then was hit close to the I-5. Wolf O'er 93. It was hunger, not the lust I imagined, or the wasted no shame how you sang. 
your leg shattered on the side of the road, a cemetery, a ghost sorrowing through grass in winter. I read about you on the news, wondered how to calculate lonely. What level would you be besides the highest? Not hunger, not love. I'm still measuring the word. Uh, this next poem is um, one that I just was fortunate enough to be in a Writers by Writers uh, workshop with Patricia Smith, and we were um, tasked to write a personification poem about something that grabbed our attention on the news, and this headline popped up for me on the New York Times, October 17, 2023, and it's the epigraph. It says, when is a species extinct? U.S. is close to naming 21, but not this woodpecker. So this is about the ivory-billed woodpecker, which hasn't been seen in uh, a long time. And the last one that was reportedly seen was a female flying from a tree that was being cut down. So the title of this poem, because um, a lot of times uh, the nickname is Lord Godbird. So this, uh, the title is Lord God Bitch. <laughs> you better get my name right, because this white bill isn't even ivory. And in these woods I own each double tap of my beak like an echo. Blowing song, chainsaw soft through forest. Because I am medicine, feather and bones, raise your head and worship. Okay, so now I'm going to get into some fiction here. And this is a, a chapter out of uh, my manuscript that I'm working on, and it's um, forthcoming in Three Penny Review in the summer of uh, this summer, and it'll show up as a miscellaneous piece. Um, it's titled The Felon, the Hobo, and Their Child. Medical, August 8th, 2015, at 0207 hours. Who's there? She side-eyed my long arms. Chickasaw sun circles. Garfish with mouth open, an ivory-billed woodpecker's spreading wings fell out of the short sleeves of my uniform shirt, fading at each wrist, peeking out of my collar, the beak of it, my head a clean scalp, freshly shaven before bed. She was either faking or couldn't move anything besides her eyes, dancing them between Captain Diaz and my arms, as her head and body rested on one side, deep into the shag carpet. Her gray-white hair streamed in all directions, like she was suspended in frozen water. She looked a little like my mother. I stood still and took it all in. She wasn't able to put her eyes on you guys yet. I couldn't wait. You're here to steal my stuff again. She closed her eyes tight as if she was expecting one of us to hit her. Are you hurting anywhere? I asked, kneeling next to her small body. She was so tiny and pale. Can you move? Is that the felon or the tiny hobo talking? She asked as her eyes lunged open, then back and forth like she was nervous, between my tattoos and Cap's messed up hair, untucked and wrinkled shirt, then down to the untied laces of his boots. I said, are you slobs here to rob me again? Who's the hobo, Cap laughed while holding his tender ribs and looked at me and the new guy. Fuck, that's funny. New guy didn't laugh. We are the fire department, I said. You called us. I wanted the ones on TV, not this. <laughs> she pressed her hand deeper into the carpet like she was trying to lift herself but did not move. John, get your gun. They are here again. I'm going to roll you onto your back and my partner's going to lift your legs from the front, I said softly, just like last time. We slowly tipped her over, legs curled and wet. I rested her back against my thighs and waist. I could feel her soak into me. New guy kneeled in front and supported her from the knees like she was going into labor. He looked at me for answers. Cap, can you grab me a towel out of the bathroom and set it on the bed, I asked, since he was already looking around the room for something. Support her from the knees, I said. Ew, new guy said. I got some on me. 
Seriously, I said as I shook my head side to side. Cap came back with a small washcloth and a cordless phone. Found it, he said, as, his as he raised his sunglasses to the top of his head while tossing a small towel in my direction without looking. He held the phone and stared at her, back toward the bathroom, then at the phone again. I grabbed beneath those soft arms and barely, barely lifted, while new guy ho hoisted his forearm under both legs like he was going to do reps with her body. We lowered her to the bed in a sitting position. I kept one hand on her shoulder for stability. Why is this boy with you? Her eyes squinted at his face. He looks 12. Cap held his side and doubled over in laughter. I broke my own protocol and laughed too. New guy was 18 and he did look young. Probably could pass for 16. 12 was a stretch. But his face twisted like he had been told that before. Go into the bathroom and get her in continence undergarments. My finger pointed the way for him. This time you are changing her. I'll train you. Is he your son? She asked. <laughs> he wishes, I laughed again. <laughs> like I was trying to hold in a cough but couldn't. What a bad habit, I thought. Look how tiny he is, she said, and then pointed at Cap. Is he his son? He's not my son, Cap said while wiping his eyes. She's killing me. It is his son, I whispered, with my index finger up to my lips. Shh, no one has told him yet. <laughs> it's our secret, she smiled and winked. The daughter finally showed up and grabbed the depends from new guy's hand while he stood there. Again, Mom? She held the small head in her against her side and brushed silver hair with spread fingers. I'm so sorry you guys had to come out here again tonight. I promise this will be the last time. I will have her fully moved into my place by tomorrow. We went back to the station and washed our uniform pants and shirts, even Cap did. We showered, went to our rooms, and then laid down, and I waited for her to wake us again. A little after three in the morning, we'd go back to her. She would be on the floor in the same spot, but this time her eyes were closed, not accusing us of anything. Colder than usual, colder than the room, her blood settled in the body's saddest valleys. Jaw stiff and closed, Cap leaned in and over her body searching for something, he stood up straight and went into the bathroom. How did she call us? he asked as he came back into the room. Are you calling it, B? Is she gone? Somehow she even looked more like my mother. She was now heavy, disappearing deeper into the carpet, floating, but not floating away. So I have, I'm going to finish with uh, two poems. Um, this first one was, uh, man, so my father passed away when I was about 15 and he was barely in my life. And then my mom sent me a picture a few years ago of him holding me. And this is, I rarely can write a poem like right off the bat, like it takes just time and time again. But this is one of the few ones that just came out and uh, you know it's just basically what I saw in the picture and then what I felt at the moment and it was published in the Black Lesbian Literary Collective in an um, open chapbook um, submission series and it's titled Upon Finding a Picture of My Estranged Father Holding Me. There I am in the February sun feeling his gaze. I look only days old. The winter shadowed behind his shirtless body cradles me in uncertainty. He shields me from cold. This is what a father feels like. He once held me wrapped in smile. And then uh, this, the last one I have is, um, this is forthcoming in Three Penny Review too. It'll show up, I think, in the fall. It's called uh, Doing CPR on Some Dude Who Looks Just Like My Father. <laughs> 
and he has been dead for so many years I barely recognize him. But for him, I could fake that heart into beating a few more times. Of compressions, I'd breathe for him, press my lips into his even though it's against protocol. Ribs give under weight, I fall through. 31 shitty, 32 beautiful, reunited minutes, I lose count. In the chaos of the body, I barely knew him anyway. In the ambulance, my hands consent to skin becoming cold. Arms practice pushing away. At the hospital, they cannot separate us. So I apologize for the violence of not letting go. Hand for Ivy Thank you for giving us some cross drama work, Ivy. That was very exciting. Excited to introduce our next reader as well. Next up, Alex Tiger of Muscogee Creek Nation is a fiction writer and native professional, originally from Denver, Colorado. He has a bachelor's in philosophy and economics from the University of Colorado, and is pursuing an MFA in creative writing from the Institute of American Indian Arts. Outside of his writing on contemporary Muscogee experiences, Alec works in economic and community development with tribal nations across the lower 48. He's currently based in Santa Cruz, California. Please give a hand for Alec Tiger. Okay. Um, thank you, Deborah, for letting me sub in today. And uh, this is a new story that I've been working on. Uh, it's about Oklahoma, and it's called Rick's Chevelle. And tried to edit it into 10 minutes, so. Um, we were driving in Rick's shitbox 1970 Chevelle, and there wasn't much place to go. It was a spring day, but it felt like summer. Back then, the spring was miserable. It was rainy and windy and gray all the time, so it was notable that it was sunny and calm and the sky was blue overhead. We rolled down to the gas station by the casino, wind blowing and music blaring like we were headed into the Las Vegas Strip. That was the day I felt really certain about this place, how things worked around here, the logic of it all, the way it's all connected. Because in a serious sort of way, I think that if you understand one thing, like really understand everything about it and how it is, then you understand everything. The shitbox had been sitting in the ditch behind his mom's house for years, but he got it pulled out and running a few days before. It was a four-speed model from way back, but it didn't shift into third, so you had to stay in first or second. If you got it going really fast in second, you could shift up to fourth and then you were really fine. But the engine was still pretty trashed and the mufflers had holes in it, so it sounded like you were firing off rounds from a pump-action shotgun driving down the street. We pulled up to one of the pumps. Rick kept the radio on and the speakers carried through the parking lot. We went over to the little benches they got for whoever the hell wants to sit out front of the gas station, maybe eat their two-for-one fried chicken sandwiches. <laughs> we were feeling too good to eat anything, so we stood around smoking cigarettes and watching the people come in and out. My cousin worked in there, and I could see him through the window watching us. He kept looking over while he was ringing up the other customers, trying to make eye contact with me. I pretended like I didn't notice him, like all I could see was my own reflection in the window. Rick lit another cigarette and sat on the table with his feet resting on the bench, taking account of who was in the parking lot, who was coming in and out, like he knew where they were going and where they were coming from, like he knew all there was to know. Rick's auntie pulled up in a little Honda that looked even more fucked up than Rick Chevelle. She started the pump and filled it for about 10 seconds. Then she walked over to us. You can't even park in one of the spaces instead of at the pump, she said. We park where we want, Rick said. Fucking car looks good there by the pump. You guys are coming to my place, yeah, she said. Yep, yeah, sure thing. Soon as we finish up on the prime rib special at the casino, Rick said. That's only on Mondays, I said. He shoved his elbow into me. Come on, buddy, you can go for the prime rib, he said. Then you guys need to get over to my place, Rick's auntie said. I need you to help me move my couch, man. I told you last week. We'll be there, Rick said. No problem. We're going to have lunch, and then I got to run to the hardware store in Banks, and we'll be right there. Wait, where are you taking me, I asked. He shoved his elbow into me again. Don't worry about it, he said. You guys come to my place or first, his aunt said. Okay, okay, we can do that, Rick said. She took a few steps back towards the car. She looked at us really serious. Melissa, there couldn't be any mistake about it. You come to my place first, she said again. I gotta get him 
I gotta get back to my uncle's, man, I said. You get him to his uncle's, Rick Santi said, after you come to my place and you get him to his uncle's. We're gonna do it all, Rick said. We're gonna get the prime rib, we're gonna go to the hardware store, we're gonna go to his goddamn uncle's place, and we're gonna help you move your couch, all right? It's settled. And it felt like it was settled. Fucking beautiful day, though, she said. She looked up at the sky and all around it like she was interrogating smudges on the ceiling. Like there was something amiss in that big, beautiful sky. Like there was some big black tear right in the middle of it. That's how she was looking at the sky, but there wasn't a cloud in it. It was blue all over. You all right, Auntie, Rick said. She snapped out of it, looked at us again, real serious. Don't fuck me over, she said. Rick gave her a big thumbs up, his fist up and over his head like he may have been giving it to the sky on the beautiful day. I did the same. Goddamn crazy ass, he said. She's got three kids in the house. You'd think one of them could help her. What's this about the hardware store, I said. Seriously, those kids are bums, Rick said. They're my relatives, but they're bums. I gotta get over to my uncle's place. I can't go all the way to Jenks. Don't worry about it, he said. We'll get you back. But seriously, we should go for a prime rib. Go over and see if you can get us new player's cards. If there was a new worker at the cage, sometimes you could pull one over on them and get a new player's card. $10 free play on the slots, and if it was Monday, $5 prime rib special. It was Tuesday, but sometimes you could pull one over on the people in the restaurant, too. But my cousin was the one working the cage, and her boss was there with her. Her boss was a white woman who wore a real slick-looking black pantsuit, like she was someone really important. Like she was a bit more important than my cousin in her clean white button-up and navy slacks. I knew it was fucked, but I tried anyways. My cousin was turned away. She didn't see me coming. I walked right up to the window. Can I get a player's card? I asked like I knew I could. I slid my ID in the little slot under the plastic window. She saw it was me, and her face had a look of dread. It felt overdone to me, the dread. (laughs) Come on, man, I already know you have one, she said. I don't think so, I said. This is the Duck Creek Casino, right? Nope, I don't have one here. Come on, Reg, don't make a scene, she said. You think since you're on that side of that window and I'm on this side, you get to make all the rules, I said. Just go home, she said. I thought you got cleaned up. Just go home and relax. I'll come see you later. Is there a problem, her boss asked. She looked like she thought she was the most important person in the world, like it was her sworn duty to the Muscogee Creek Nation to make sure that no one pulled a fast one on the player card system at the Duck Creek Casino. (laughs) Just trying to get a player's card, I said. Your employee doesn't want to give me one. He's my cousin, my cousin said. Can you get him out of here, her boss said. I told him to leave, my cousin said. I need you to focus on work, her boss said. Can't have friends coming around distracting you. I'm her cousin, not her friend. Sir, do you have a player's card? I think I got one up at River Spirit. He has one here, my cousin said. I had this feeling like she could have helped out then. Like she could have tried. Like she could have prioritized her cousin and her people and her whole goddamn community at that moment. So Rick and I could have just had a good goddamn meal and I could have gone to my uncle's and he could have gone to the hardware store or his aunt's or whatever he was going to do. Rick probably felt that something was off then anyways. Uh, Not that he was smarter than I was. But he always seemed to have already done whatever the right thing to do was, and I always seemed to be in the middle of doing whatever the wrong thing to do was. Because in that moment, while I was making a scene, and I was definitely making a scene, he took off. And there was no way I could have heard it. All I heard was the spinning in the slot machines and my own voice getting louder until I was all out yelling at that white lady that she was my cousin, uh, that was my cousin's boss, asking her what gave her the right and telling her she had no right and that all the goddamn extra money in this place makes goes back to my own community center anyways but fuck if i know what they spend the money on because i could only get one player's card and get one five dollar prime rib special but while i was ailing all that and the security guard had me by the back of my collar pretty much carrying me out of there and burying his foot up as far up my ass as he could to get me through the front door i swear i could hear that shitbox chevelle firing up pump action rounds and peeling out of the gas station i swear i could hear it and by the time i was out there on the street rick was gone It was just how I envisioned the day going. (laughs) Uh, And it was just how I figured, and it kept on going just how I figured it would. That's what I mean when I say I felt like I really understood something then. Not that I could write it out like some equation, but I got it. It was the kind of thing that stretched all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Like how the Big Bang caused all the matter to go out in a certain direction and at a certain speed. And all that was fixed in such a way that some of the matter spun around itself for long enough to create Earth. And somewhere along the line, life was formed. And all that causation that led to everything also led to that day and to those moments. Because fuck, I got out on the street and it was supposed to be spring, but it was flaming hot and my head was heavy like I hadn't drank water on a summer day. I didn't even think about Rick once I got out there. I just walked down the street that's basically a highway and the cars flew past like they had rocket launchers instead of exhaust pipes. 
I started to calm down at some point, and it occurred to me that I looked dirty and fucked up and walking along the highway, and I didn't want to look like that at all, so I turned down the next road I could. It was a paved road, but it used to be dirt, and nature wanted it to be dirt too, so it was all uneven and potholed, and I walked on the side of it. While I was walking then, and I didn't know how far I'd gone, some guy rode by on a little BMX bike. He was a big guy, and he made that bike look like it would fit better for his kid. <clears throat> he had a bandana on his head, and blue jeans, and big black combat boots, and a leather vest with no shirt underneath. Fuck, his arms were huge, and any skin that was showing was a beautiful, golden, glistening brown. I thought he was going to ride right past me, and he did, but then I heard his back tire drift around his combat boots and come back behind me. He rode right up next to me, coasting beside my strides. I kept walking, and he kept coasting. Every few steps, he dropped one of his boots on the pedal to keep pace with me. The gears squeaked every time he did. You need a ride, he asked. On that thing, you're crazy, I said. It was hot, and it occurred to me that I might be crazy. It's got pegs, he said. He jerked his head back so I'd look. That thing barely holds you, I said. I've seen you before, man, he said. Let me help you out. What direction are you going anyways, I asked. Back down the road. There's nothing off this way, he said. I gotta get to my uncle's house, he said. I said, uh, is it back in these woods? No. Let me give you a ride then, he said. That guy, I didn't even know who he was. I hadn't seen him before. He might have not even lived anywhere near here. He might have been riding these back roads all across the country and for all of eternity. Or he might have just been going to get fried chicken at the gas station by the casino. I got on the back of his little bike, stood up on the pegs. He rode it slow, but enough, but enough for my hair to brush back in a breeze. And before I knew what happened, he took me all the way back, dropped me off right at my uncle's house. I thought it then, and for whatever reason, I still think it now. He could be the most brilliant person that ever existed in the universe. People think I'm crazy, but I mean it. And it could be my cousin, or Rick, or Rick's auntie. All these fuckers. The whole lot of them. Brilliant. Amazing. One more hand for Alec Tiger, please. Now, before I forget to say it, if I do forget to say it, that I am in very invigorated by the talent that has been brought to this room tonight, and I'm so glad to be here with all of you. So all three of you who have read so far, thank you so kindly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll say, too, that uh, Deborah Tapa has been instrumental in bringing all of these people together here tonight, and it's been a total pleasure to work with Deborah. Thank you so kindly. And uh, that's a great segue into introducing our next reader, who is Deborah Jackson Tapa. Uh, her debut book, Whiskey Tender, has received advanced praise from Elle magazine, from the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, Millions, Electric Literature, and San Francisco Chronicle, with fellowships from the NEA and Prose, Pen America, Tin House, McDowell, Lona Jop, and the New York State Summer Writers Institute. Deborah received her MFA in Iowa City. She's the editor-in-chief at River Sticks Magazine, and she is the director of the MFA in Creative Writing Program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She is a citizen of the Yuma Quatsang Nation and Laguna Pueblo. Please give a big hand for Deborah Jackson. Woo! Thank you. It was such a special day today with the eclipse, and I'm thinking about how um, they say that it means that we have new expectations for ourselves in the world. And I'll tell you that I have enormous expectations from the people who I am so lucky to meet at IAIA. All of the talent coming through there is incredible. And I know you all have heard about the first indigenous literary renaissance that was launched by N. Scott Momaday. And I'll tell you that the future, these next five to 10 years, are going to have so many exciting voices coming out of Santa Fe. So keep your eyes on IAIA and make sure that you read all those books. So I'm just going to read a short section from Whiskey Tender. It's the opening, and it's called Animus. The highway to Silverton, Silverton Colorado, is an air-popping ascent with hairpin turns and missing guardrails. Dad hugged the mountainside with the van as we climbed, tapping his horn before each blind curve to warn truckers of our presence. We had left the hellish reservation border town we just moved to behind, 
and we're headed to a vacation paradise located past a ski resort named Purgatory. As soon as Dad pulled into our favorite camping spot on the Animus River, I jumped out of the van and ran down to the water. At the age of 12, I was still knobby-kneed and tube-socked, my brown skin splattered with mud. How lucky it felt to be a kid, unhindered by a woman's body. My bones remained hollow and birdie that summer, boyish and inconsequential for a few more blissful months. Tell me your favorite childhood memory, and I'll tell you who you are. I remember the laughter my sisters and I shared as we tossed tiny balls of bread to see through fish along the shoreline. I remember Dad fiddling with the worms he used for bait, and Mom asking a kayaker about a rapid called mandatory thrashing. I remember all of us working together to pitch the tent and make a temporary home. Our time on the river felt like spiritual repair. Dad grilled the trout we caught during the day. He whittled long marshmallow sticks, and we sat around the fire listening to his reservation ghost stories. The fog wall that rose one night when his buddies chanted Indian songs. The mountain lion girl that scared him as a kid. Dad burned with energy, and long after the moon rose in the sky, he kept talking. We'd go to bed exhausted, knowing that in the morning he would heat our shoes by the fire he stoked at sunrise. Nostalgia plays tricks on memory, and the Animus River is consistently sepia-tented in my mind. Dad was always my hero anyway, so when I remember him at the river, I remember his bonfire stories, or the way he used to let us touch the dent in his skull where he got shot by his brother's arrow. I don't stop to think about his anger, or his strict rules, or how often he was gone. I don't dwell on his workaholic ways, or consider the overbearing weight he and mom placed on us to excel. Remembering the river helps me forget, at least for a moment, the challenges, fears, and feelings of inadequacy I experienced in my childhood. My own set of rose-colored glasses, a trick of the mind that helps me highlight the peaceful days, the quiet ones that punctuated the violence, pressures, and confusion of being a native girl in a northwestern New Mexico town where cowboys still hated Indians. Three white teenagers had murdered three native men just before my family and I moved there for my father's new job when I was six years old. Navajo people marched in the streets that April, and though we missed the protest and backlash, the town's tension remained consistent, even after the Civil Rights Commission came in to keep the peace. My early childhood took place in an era when good native families didn't move off their home reservations, because close friends and relatives called relocation a betrayal. It was a time of conflicting choices, when young people like my father and his siblings, who grew up on the reservation, faced a dilemma that pitted high reservation unemployment and double-digit inflation against the desire to belong to their tribe. In moving from our Quetzal Yuma Reservation in California to the Navajo Reservation in New Mexico, my father chose to be an individual. And my parents decided they wanted their kids to be mainstream Americans, passing down an implicit appreciation of social climbing, along with and in conflict with the realization that our people are excluded, ironically, from the central mythologies of the American identity. I want to say ours is the iconic American story but that would insult our non-native allies, the decent folk for whom the consequences of broken treaties and forced assimilation are already a burden and for whom oppression may also be an inheritance. I don't tell this story to create a divide. I tell it because there are too many dark corners in America that can be relieved of persistent shadows by shining a little light. I tell it because our story belongs to all Americans some of whom may be surprised by our history. I tell it to celebrate our survival as a culture, as well as the hope, strength, and grace of my family. This story is as common as dirt, 
thousands of Native Americans in California, Arizona, and New Mexico could tell it. Anyone with a grandpa who was haunted by Indian boarding school, who stung his family like a dust devil when he drank. Anyone with a grandma who washed laundry until her fingernails cracked and bled, who went without eating when there weren't enough groceries because she wanted her 10 kids to have a few extra bites. Anyone with a mother who kept secrets so her kids wouldn't find out about their father's jailbird past. Anyone with a father who chose the violence of industrial labor over the violence of reservation life because he wanted his kids to get through private school and make better lives for themselves. So many people could tell this story, it's shocking how rarely it has been told. Too many mothers have watched their kids thrown into cop cars without protest. Too many aunties have put ice on black eyes without saying a word. Too many grandmothers have watched their grandchildren, their hope for the future, head out to a party and never come home. Too many girls have pretended nothing happened after experiencing sexual harassment, only to redirect the hate toward the innocent face staring back at them in the mirror. Native memoirs are rare because there are rules on Indian reservations. We fear appropriation and fight about who has the right to speak. Talking to outsiders is taboo, and our belief systems often go against this kind of preservation and self-telling. So why divulge my story? Because I want Native kids to feel more connected and less lonely. Because I hate the portrayal of my people as dependents, unable to better their own circumstances and tell their own stories. Because I need to understand what aspects of my personality were seated in that New Mexican town all those years ago. My inheritance stretches back to the so-called Anasazi, over a thousand years in the cacti, sage, and sandstone lands, in the desert canyons, adobe homes, and turquoise stone southwest. America runs like a river through my veins, yet throughout my childhood, Native representation gathered dust in museums. On television, in books, I saw costumes and mascots, never a portrayal of a mixed tribe Native girl listening to music on her Walkman. Without a contemporary likeness of myself in the media, there was no confirmation that anything I experienced in my childhood was real. My father was born in 1941, and he taught me never to confuse pity with comprehension. His Quetzalan Yuma grandfather was born in a time when California's Indian population had plummeted 90% because of foreign diseases, Catholic slave labor, and the government's hiring of private militia to bring in Indian scalps. California's first governor, Peter Hardiman Burnett, openly promoted genocide, calling for a, quote, war of extermination in his 1851 second state address. With the help of the U.S. Army, the California legislature distributed weapons to vigilantes who raided native homes and killed 100,000 of my ancestors in the first two years of the gold rush alone. The legislature paid 1.1 million to these murderers, and when it was done, the U.S. Congress agreed to reimburse the state. When I was younger, I avoided writing about these atrocities. I told myself it sounded conceited. To have survived that much violence, my ancestors must have been powerful. It was like I was claiming to have super genes. Today, I know my hesitation was shame, the silence that follows an apocalypse, to talk about what we suffered, to concede that we were victims, was not something we did in my family. And yet to write about the culture that was taken via the government's assimilation policies, I must acknowledge the pain and remember the beauty in the middle-class life my parents jerry-rigged for me and my siblings in the high desert arroyos and sun-scorched histories of the American Southwest. I was raised to believe in the reciprocity of the land, and I know that if I went back now, I would see that our favorite camping spot near Purgatory has aged just as much as me. During my childhood in the 1980s, 
My family and I were fishing on the shores of change. The Animus was the last free-flowing water in Colorado before it was dammed at the start of the 21st century. A bald eagle refuge, not yet injured by the wastewater that bled from the Gold King mine in 2015. Dad said the river's full name was the Rio de las Animas Perdidas, or the River of Lost Souls. He said if we got up early, we might get lucky and see them, the spirits of our ancestors floating downstream in the early morning fog. I remember waking up and calling dad to bring me my basketball shoes while I was still in my sleeping bag. Warm from their place near the fire, the shoes canvas made my toes cozy. I ran down to the water where the grass was stiff with frost and there was the smell of smoky pine in every breath. I squatted to wash my face, squinting at the outline of what I imagined to be the spirits of our ancestors on the other shore. If only I knew their names, I thought, maybe I could help them get home. Today, they are the ones bringing me home. Reflecting on my visit to the Animus River when I was 12, I hold my ancestors close to my heart, knowing I too will be an ancestor someday, adding to the chain of lives that came before. With death as my guide, I remember what's important and listen for the river even now. Do not participate in the erasure of your own people, the voices murmur. Do not be a silent witness as we fade. Thank you. So thank you to Lit Quake for co-sponsoring this with us. Um, we have copies of Whiskey Tender at the front register. You can find them there. And would you be willing to sign some yeah. copies? Yeah. She'll sign them. Um, Deborah also has an event tomorrow at City Lights, if you want to hear a little more about the book. I'll read fun stuff tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, this is my first California reading. So oh my gosh! Oh, I have to read it. First California reading. Um, that's the uh, total honor. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate all of you. <laughs> if you have any questions, let me know. And if not, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, one more thing from Lake Quick. So I forgot to mention this at the top, um, but this event was recorded for Lit Quake's podcast, LitCast, that records live literary events across the Bay Area. So if you know anyone who wanted to make it tonight but couldn't, this event recording will be available on, again, our website, litquake.org, um, soon. And we'll let Green Apple know. And yeah, please share. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody.